My friends, if you have not yet had the experience as a practicing Catholic, you certainly will have the experience of a non-Catholic Christian coming up to you and saying, where in Scripture is the Immaculate Conception? Or where in Scripture is the Assumption of Mary? Or where in Scripture is her perpetual virginity? Not only for this reason, but also for the reason of balance in terms of our love of Mary, we have to go to the sources of divine revelation. We have to go to the question of where do we know God's will? How does God manifest His will to us and what's the proper source so that we know how we're supposed to live as Christians, both in general but also specifically in terms of our proper response to the mother of Jesus? Now, St. Thomas Aquinas, master of distinctions, would say you want to avoid two extremes uh, by that golden mean. And, and the two extremes, he would say, is, is the, the excess on one uh, hand and defect uh, on the other hand. Excess is too much. Defect is too little. So, what is Marian excess? What is excess in regard to the mother of Jesus? Well, any time anyone places Mary on a level of equality with Jesus Christ, puts her as a fourth person of the Trinity, that is gross Marian excess. It's blasphemy, it's idolatry. Again, it wounds the heart of Mary herself. So that's too much. That's going past the truth, the divine revelation. Marian, and in fact, <clears throat> there was a group, there was a, uh, an early Christian sect, it was actually a group of uh, women who considered themselves priestesses that tried to offer mass to Mary. Uh, that's wrong on, on all counts. Uh, both the women priestesses, which is a uh, metaphysical, ontological, theological impossibility, and offering mass to Mary, which is blasphemy, heresy. So that's the excess, and we certainly want to stay away from excess. On the other hand, you've got Marian defect. Marian defect is too little Mary. Whenever an individual does not ascribe to Mary what the church teaches about her, the truth about her, and therefore the corresponding love, you have Marian defect. That means anytime, for example, anyone hesitates to call Mary mother, when they're not accepting what is revealed uh, from Jesus at the cross, John 19, 25 through 27, when Jesus says, Behold your mother, uh, his gift of motherhood from himself and from his mother to each one of us, as well as the other teachings of the church regarding Mary, that she is queen, that she's a mediatrix, that she's advocate, as we'll talk about much, that she's co redemptrix, that she uniquely contributes with Jesus in the work of redemption, always subordinate and dependent on him. So we've got excess and defect. And quite frankly, my friends, right now, in, in terms of the two, both things we want to uh, completely avoid, we've got more Marian defect than we do Marian excess. How many people of the seven billion people alive today call Mary mother? Whenever someone doesn't call Mary mother, that is an objective Marian defect because it's not ascribing to the truth about Mary. So, how do we protect from excess and defect? Well, we protect by the truth. And where do we get the truth? We get the truth from God. And where do we get the truth of God? In what the Second Vatican Council calls the sources of divine revelation. We get the truth about God as we will examine, uh, in, in essence, the document De Verbum uh, from the Second Vatican Council, which really just summarizes the beauty of the Church's tradition on this, that there is one twinfold source of divine revelation. That means one source, two aspects or facets, but it's really coming down to one source. Sacred tradition and sacred Scripture, okay, sacred tradition and sacred scripture. Well, let's start with sacred tradition. Tradition, 
far from being just things kind of passed on like a local custom, is in fact a source of divine revelation. It's a source of God revealing himself and his will to humanity for humanity's sake. That's what divine revelation is. Uh, it's an act of love that God reveals himself and his will to us for the sake of our salvation. It's win-win it's for us. It's all beneficial for us. Now, sacred tradition constitutes the divine truths of God in Christ passed orally to the apostles and their successors through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So let's look at that again, because quite frankly, tradition's the part that most people have a fuzzy idea of or, or don't have an idea of at all. Tradition is that which Jesus passes on to, uh, we're talking about, of course, the fulfillment of the Old Testament in the New Testament and continuing on in the person revelation of Jesus, Jesus passing truth and life to the apostles and their successors under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Well, who are the apostles and the successors? That constitutes the popes and bishops in union with the popes. We'll talk about later the sad event if a bishop is not in union with the pope, uh, to which degree he cuts himself off, he segregates himself as part of the minister of divine revelation. So, sacred tradition comes first, something sacred handed down under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And I, I want to take, for example, the way St. John ends his gospel. So this is John 21, verses 24 and 25. And let me just uh, read the end of his gospel. He says, quote, There are, however, many other things that Jesus did. But if every one of these should be written, not even the world itself, I think, could hold the books that would have to be written. That's a rather odd way to end a gospel. It's, it's, it's ending the gospel open-ended, saying that there's many other things Jesus did, so much so that if it was all written, the world itself couldn't hold the books. Okay. Now let me give you an example of what we sometimes expect to be in the gospels, uh, which are really unfair and, and somewhat impossible. Let's say that you're with 11 other people. Let's say you're at, uh, at a university and you're dorming with these 11 other people. Let's say they're obviously of the same gender uh, and you're in the same uh, fraternity or, or, or social group. And so you live and pray and study together for three years. And let's say you're an exceptional group. So in three years you graduate. You graduate early instead of the typical four years for undergrads. At the end of that period of time, if someone came up to you and said, look, you didn't know it, but one of the people you were with was actually God, and we want to get everything we can about that person. He was actually an incarnate God. Of course, this is not reality, but, but go with the, exp uh, the example for a moment. We want to know everything he said and did for the three years that you prayed and lived and, 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 and studied together, everything. But you know what? Can you keep it to about 30 pages? You would say, well, that's impossible. I, I, uh, 30 pages would take the first you know, week or two weeks of what this person said and did. Well, that's the same type of unrealistic expectation we sometimes put on the gospel writer, that everything Jesus did and said and experienced, all the miracles, all the teachings, would all be contained in the gospel. Uh, well, John ends it the opposite way. John points to another source of revelation. He points to the reality of the incompleteness of the gospel. Now, and let's be clear here, as we'll talk about, Scripture is inerrant. Uh, there's no errors, it's inspired. But as we'll talk about later as well, nowhere in Scripture does it say that Scripture is the only source of revelation. And clearly, the gospel writers don't pose to say, yes, we, we, we covered everything Jesus did. Uh, that would be ludicrous, especially in a, in a brief writing, like relatively briefly, like the gospel writers have written. So, this fact in itself points to the reality of tradition, something beyond the written word, which is also part of the revelation of Jesus Christ 
for himself, who he is, what he is, and his revelation to the church. Now, let me bring up another example. <clears throat> Let's use the example of 34 AD. Okay, now, by 34 AD, I just mean one year after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, regardless of the accurate or historical discussion of, of exactly when Jesus was born, 4, 4 BC or whatever. Not our issue. One year after Jesus ascends into heaven, is there a saving gospel? Is there a church? Are there sacraments? Do you have sacred orders, at least in terms of apostles or bishops? And ultimately, ultimately, if you die believing in the message of Jesus Christ in 34 AD, one year after he's ascended into heaven, will you receive eternal salvation? What's fascinating, my friends, most Christians, most all Christians, will say yes to all those questions. Yeah, of course. Uh, if you were an early martyr uh, and it was just a year after Jesus uh, uh, died and rose again and ascended into heaven and you believed and you lived that faith, you, you would be saved. Well, what's the point? The point is it's not for at least, at least another 15 years that we have the first letter of the New Testament written. Scholars will say somewhere between 49 and 51 with Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. The point is tradition comes first. The oral gospel comes first. The lived church experience comes first. And then what happens? Well, then what happens is the Holy Spirit inspires certain people to write down this tradition, to write down this Christian life. Uh, and that would include uh, elements of, uh, of doctrine and, and Jesus' teachings and some ref references to liturgy and, and the, 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 the heart of what, in fact, is the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ. The point is, if you have the idea that the New Testament comes first, and, and, I, and I say this not facetiously, just, just to try to illustrate the point, or the idea that somehow the New Testament just comes out of the sky, and it's a book, and it's complete, and it calls for no interpretation. We don't know where it came. It just kind of came from the sky, and therefore it's, it's to be taken independently and comprehensively. That's both historically and theologically impossible. It's simply not the way it happened. Tradition comes first. The mother, who is the church, gives birth, a beautiful birth, to the New Testament, which is the written form of the tradition which comes first. And so tradition comes first with the oral gospel. And as we know, and again, based on different summaries of scholarship, Different Gospels are reportedly written in 55 and then 60, maybe 75, and then finally John somewhere around 90 to 95. And again, scholars can have legitimate differences about that, but we clearly do not have the New Testament even written in its fullness uh, for another 50, 60 plus years after the ascension of Jesus. So that tells you the church saves and the church is the mother from which the New Testament, that beautiful child, comes forth. But as we'll mention, you never want to have the child speak against the mother. You never want to quote the child against the mother. It's unseemly, even in a public uh, setting, when a child sasses back or, or is, is uh, sarcastic to the parent, uh, it's just not right. It's inappropriate. So, too, you don't want to quote Scripture, particularly the New Testament in, in our analogy here, the child against the mother, who is the church, from which that child comes. So, tradition comes first. Tradition is, as Dei Verbum number 8 says from the Second Vatican Council, sacred tradition comes from Christ through the apostles and, quote, makes progress in the church with the help of the Holy 
Spirit. You know, what does that mean? Makes progress in the church with the help of the Holy Spirit. That means that Jesus Christ gives all the final doctrinal seeds during his time on earth and, and what we call public revelation. Public revelation ends with the death of John the Apostle. That means with the death of John the Apostle, no new doctrinal seeds. That means no new divinely revealed truths that are essential for salvation, which uh, encompass authentic Christian doctrine. Well, what, what happens then? Well, the seeds develop. The seeds grow. And that means we understand the seeds better. We, we get a better theological and pastoral and, and, and spiritual devotional understanding of these seeds so we can live them better. And that's why, as great theologians like Cardinal Newman said, this development doctrine, it's, it's really a process of, of if, if you will, Jesus having the acorns and then in the, in the history of the church, these acorns become oak trees of dogma and doctrine. Greater understanding, greater clarity, that means better for us because these are the things that protect us. Remember, the teachings of Jesus are not arbitrary. He's not coming, coming up with things to say, well, I've got to test them on something, so I'm going to test them saying black is white and white is black and, and you know, see whether they're going to accept that. These are guidelines for joy, for love, for happiness. Uh, to live the life of Christ is the thing that protects our peace. They're not arbitrary. They're essential based on who we are. So the more we understand them, the better it is for us. This, this, is, this is part of the blessing of the Holy Spirit helping us understand the life of Christ in a more profound way. This is all good. This is all positive. So let, let, me, let me give this example. Let's say that a newly married couple have the grace and blessing of conceiving on their wedding night. And some of you might be quick to retort, oh, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily so good. I mean, um, you know, on the wedding night, don't they need a little time? Excuse me, don't, don't they need a little time to get to know each other before they bring children into the marriage? Here's a little pastoral rule that might be helpful for you. Uh, don't marry someone you don't know. Uh, you want to know someone in their heart and soul before you marry them, and then you can know them in their body after you marry them. Uh, God gives youth for a reason to keep up with the rascals. Having been being a father of eight, uh, I was grateful for an early marriage and being quick about the beauty of having children. Back to the example. When the couple conceive, the married couple conceive on their wedding night, there's a child in that woman's womb. Now, who knows it? Well, not the couple even necessarily, at least for a couple weeks. After that, it's God willing, it's the husband who knows after the wife, after the wife tells him that she's with child. Uh, the rest of the world won't know uh, unless the couple tell them uh, until the woman starts showing around the fourth month uh, with your first child, somewhere around that period of time. Then, eventually, nine months later, the whole world knows with uh, a piercing cry and tears in the eyes of the parents that, indeed, this miracle called the child has been born. But in those months when no one knew that that woman was pregnant, she was still pregnant. Life begins at conception. Uh, we even have marological evidence of things like that with the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady. And that child is there even if people don't know it uh, as the woman passes by. My friends, this is analogous to the, the, to the development of doctrine in the church. One could read over the passage of Genesis 3.15 and say, uh, I just don't see the Immaculate Conception. But when you have the church over centuries having a deeper and deeper understanding of what the early church understood in the first three centuries, that Mary was sine macula, she was the sinless one, altogether without sin, purer than the angels, as the early fathers of the church called her. And the more they ponder Genesis 15, that the father put absolute enmity, total opposition between the woman and the serpent and their respective seeds. Then, in the time in wisdom by popes and saints and mystics uh, and spiritual writers and theologians, we get a greater understanding of what is in Genesis 3.15. That passage, if you will, is pregnant 
with the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. But it only develops within the womb of the church, in time, in prayer, in maturity, so that by the 19th century, you don't have the invention of a doctrine, you have the declaration of a dogma. That is, you have the church saying what is already in Genesis 3.15 and Luke 1.28 in the fullness of hail full of grace, chare ke keratomene, uh, she who has been graced, she who has that fullness uh, as an action completed in the past. We'll talk about that. That's what's pronounced on the highest level of truth on December 8th of 1854. See, that's the womb of the church. That's the development of doctrine. No new seeds, but allowing the seeds to grow in the heart of the church. Now, so sacred tradition comes first with the oral gospel and the living church. The second of the, of the one, twin sold, one twinfold source, and, and Vatican II was, was strong and clear on saying, don't consider them two separate sources. Think of them as one source with two aspects or facets to them. <coughs> Excuse me. The second is sacred scripture. Sacred scripture, uh, as Dave Verbum says, is the quote, speech of God put down in writing under the breath of the Holy Spirit. It's beautiful. Scripture is a divinely revealed truth written down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is what is contained in the Old and New Testaments. And it's, it's very important to, to articulate that Scripture has the grace, the charism of, of, of inerrancy. It, it does not err, particularly in elements of doctrine and faith. It's an inspired text. Indeed, there is human authorship and there's divine authorship, but there's not error in uh, the books of Scripture. So, we have extremes with Scripture as well. You've got on one hand the literalist extreme, where people think that every line is intended literally. Well, that would be messy. Uh, for example, when Jesus says, you know, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Well, I would have been maimed and blind uh, by about age 10, if not earlier. Uh, what's the meaning of the passage? Self-mastery. That's revealed. That's inspired. That's inerrant. Uh, on the other hand, we have what's called the demythologizing extreme in Scripture, which has been a sad uh, introduction in the last two centuries. Uh, this is the idea of basically taking the supernatural out of the miracles of Old and New Testament. This does not please God because behind, my friends, behind demythologizing, basically saying, well, that didn't really happen that way. Uh, take, for example, the, the miracle of the loaves in John 6. No, that, there was no real miracle of the loaves. Uh, they just shared. That was the miracle of the heart. That's not biblical. That's not scriptural. And behind a lot of demythologizing is really a semi-Arianism, meaning that individuals are hesitant to grant Jesus his divinity. Otherwise, God doesn't have a problem with wheat creating it. God doesn't have a problem with creating bread. That's within the category of omnipotence. That's not a big thing for God. So if you hold Jesus as God, miracle of the lows is, is no great shake. It's not, that's not something beyond the imagination. Uh, and it's certainly not something beyond revelation because it's exactly what is revealed and what we're supposed to hold as true. So with scripture again, uh, avoid the extremes. Now, the relationship between Scripture and tradition. Once again, Scripture comes, excuse me, tradition comes first historically, uh, especially if you're talking about the relationship between New Testament church and the New Testament. Okay, uh, We're talking indeed, uh, with the Old Testament you have the similar reality though, of course. You have the covenant with the people between Yahweh and the people of Israel, and then it's written. So, the written version never precedes the experience or the revelation of God. It always comes after and must be respected and interpreted as the child from the mother, which is the living experience between God and the people. Also true with Jesus and the New Testament. So, tradition comes first, uh, and then you have the written version of tradition, as some would say, uh, with the inspired nature of the New Testament. So, 
If you're going to summarize the relationship between tradition and scripture, you have to say, again, historically tradition comes first. Uh, tradition, therefore, is the proper means of interpreting the written version, which we know to be the New Testament. And even historically, uh, by the time of the 4th century, there was some question about, well, what's, what's an inspired text that's part of the canon of the New Testament, or what's just inspirational? What's something that, you know, leads your heart aflame, but it's not necessarily part of the New Testament? Well, it was the church, the Council of Hippo under St. Augustine, and later confirmed by Pope Innocent I in 401, that selected the New Testament. It was later confirmed, of course, at the Council of Trent in the 16th century. So, understand this, that it, it's illogical to accept the New Testament as divinely inspired and at the same time to reject the authority of the church which designates it as such. Let me say that again. It's illogical to accept the New Testament as divinely inspired but to reject the body, the church, which selected it as such. And that was no easy task, my friends. There were thousands of early Christian writings and had to be some authority that would say, this is, uh, this is good devotional stuff, this is divinely inspired. So, and it wasn't unanimous by any means. There was a lot of controversy in identifying those texts. It was done by the church. So log logically, if you accept the New Testament as divinely inspired, you logically accept the church that selected it as such. So, Two lines from Dei Verbum. This is Dei Verbum number 10. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture form one sacred deposit of the Word of God entrusted to the church. So when you hear the expression Word of God, you don't want to think of just scripture. And you don't want to just think of tradition. You want to think of tradition and scripture. One uh, Word of God with these two aspects. And of course, the ultimate Word of God is Jesus himself. Second quote from Dei Verbum, Dei Verbum number 9. Quote, both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal feelings of devotion and reverence. You don't honor tradition over scripture. You don't honor scripture over tradition. Because in fact, the New Testament is a form of written tradition under that same Holy Spirit. Now, in the next lecture, we're going to continue this discussion, but also include the role of the magisterium, and also what all this has to do with the truth about Mary. Thank you.